today's episode has been filmed and recorded. So, if you are listening to this episode, kindly refer to the description for the YouTube link. And if you are watching today's episode on YouTube, kindly refer to the description for the podcast link for Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Every little bit helps. Thank you and enjoy today's episode. This week, our guest, an advocate for disability who has been living with cerebral palsy her entire life and hosts the I Can't Stand podcast. Presenting to you, the listener, Peter Hook. Our conversation today entails that those who are disabled should not be classed as those with special needs. We discuss her education and how her disability had not come in the way of her education, leading a normal life or even driving. So then, without any further ado, my name is Llewellyn Fisher. My name is Brendan Nell, and you are listening to Finding Borders. Roll intro, season two, episode 10. Welcome to our show today, Peter Hook from the I Can't Stand podcast. Hello. It's lovely to meet you and it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank and, you so much. And to pick your mind about disability in general, you're dealing with it, just how it affects other people, those who are allied, those who are not. And again, just a general oversight of it today. You've got the right girl. <laughs> well yes i i'd like to just get into to the first point um so just generally how because you have cerebral palsy as well, yes very aware how has that essentially progressed because you're in your 30s now where you're on the, the big three zero how are you how have you progressed from, let's say, an early age, let's say through your teens up into your 30s now? Has it actually improved? Has there been better treatments for it? Has your health improved or deteriorated? Could you walk us through that, please? So for those who don't know, cerebral palsy happens either in the womb or at birth. Um, they can't really pinpoint why it happens to certain babies, but they think for me in particular, it was because I was so premature. So I was born at 20, 28 weeks premature. So I was quite um, of a little miracle to survive because I was only two pounds when I was born. So basically it means that I didn't get enough oxygen and those you know, first couple of seconds of me being born have resulted in a lifelong disability. Cerebral palsy can affect people in all sorts of different ways, but how it presents in me is um, I'm weaker on my right side and I can't walk. So I use an electric wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And because I was born with a disability, I don't know any different. This is just mm -hmm. who I am. It's totally part of my identity. Um, Cerebral palsy isn't progressive, so it sort of is what it is from yeah. day one. Okay. So there was a lot of concentration, particularly when I was younger, to try and get me to walk. Um, I had lots of physiotherapy, all that great stuff. Um, but I decided at about 12 to focus on my academic life more than my inability to walk. And for me, that was totally the right decision sitting here now in my 30s I have a completely independent life I've got two degrees I can drive a car and I live completely independently but that's great because I you know I imagine that a lot of people can't speak for that in the sense that they're independent they can study with cerebral palsy I we, we even had um 
someone here on the show who I won't mention who had a son who at the time it was undiagnosed and they were unaware of what it was, but they had wolf Hirschen syndrome. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, and it just goes to show sometimes how little is known about certain disabilities. So then do you think that, you know, today, at least in the 30 years that you've had cerebral palsy, do you think that in that time more has become aware to the general public or more has come to light? Absolutely. I, you know, I must say I'm very privileged to have had the disability that I've been given. I'm very privileged in the way it's been presented in myself and how I'm, I'm able to be the person that I want to be sitting here today. I know that um, that's not a choice for everyone. Um, but, you know, I think it's also a big privilege for myself to have a disability that people have at least heard of or it's quite prevalent. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't know what it would be like to have a rare disability because there are so many um, physiotherapies and processes now, particularly for babies who are being born with cerebral palsy today that allow them to have more strength and, and more uh, abilities that I necessarily don't have myself. Um, I want to ask you, in the build-up to this episode, I've been talking to a lot of friends about the I Can't Stand podcast and disability in general, and I've come to understand that there's an extensive amount of misconception um, regarding cerebral palsy. For example, I heard a lot of people saying that people with cerebral palsy can't walk, which is absolutely uh, incorrect, because I've heard you just said you can drive a car. I also heard in one of your episodes that you said you actually can swim, yes. and you find there's a good form of exercise. Now, what are some other um, common misconceptions that you know of or are aware of that you can address and perhaps correct for, for our listeners? So, because disability presents in different people in different ways, I think that's where the mis understandings occur because you know you meet one person with cerebral palsy and you think oh that's what cerebral palsy is but just like both you gentlemen sitting with me today just because you're male doesn't mean you're exactly the same you know you have individualities and I'm no different to that in that sense as well probably the biggest misconception I get in regard to having a disability is I don't have friends which is just completely incorrect I'm a very social person um, many people don't understand that people with disabilities can have an education and, and do have the ability to live full lives now of course there are lots of barriers to that in regards to access to employment and access to education but that's not because of our disability it's because of the society's low expectations of us as a demographic. Well, absolutely. As I can see, one would think that you'd be an introverted person or so, but it's not. You have such a vibrant personality. You talk, and also in one of your episodes, you said you'd love to be that girl dancing on a table. And I can just see you're just such a social butterfly. And I just think it's awesome integrating this awareness, and it is just so inspirational. Thank you. I really do want to come across as the girl next door that just happens to be in a wheelchair. Well, now, Peter, with, um, so I just, to, to step back a sec, I just did a, an episode where I discussed about my process of becoming an Australian citizen. So I spoke about all the misconceptions and all the things that I had to go through, tests and apply, apply applications, I should say. Um, now, are you, much like that episode and with the I Can Stand podcast, are you trying to be a voice for anyone who might be disabled as well? Or are you trying to give the behind the scenes of what it is to live with a disability? My focus for myself is to show people what it's like to live with a disability. That was the core message of the podcast. As the podcast has progressed, I've been very lucky to be able to speak to other people with disabilities. So I don't necessarily want to be a voice for other people with disabilities, but I want to allow other people with disabilities to speak and have the, the sort of privileged position that I have to be able to jump on mic and give their point of view. And then 
with this mission of yours, have you actually been seeing results? Like have people been reaching out to your podcast in whichever manner they do and say, hey, Peter, listen, you know, you you spoke about some episode about the NDIS or Centrelink or all this and that and actually made a difference to me. Are you seeing any feedback that would suggest you are making a difference? I really hope so. I get lovely messages on my Instagram in particular, everywhere from people who live with disability that, uh, hearing a voice that they can relate to, mm. to people that have hidden disabilities and aren't as comfortable with their identity as I am and how comforting that can be for them, all the way up to people that have had no interaction with anybody with a disability before. Mm. And I've heard that assistive devices like crutches and walkers can help individuals with cerebral palsy be more mobile. And what are some other devices, exercises, therapy, et cetera, that you could um, perhaps know about or you could recommend for individuals like yourself, uh, you know, to be more functional and get a bit more independent um, for their motor skills through activities of daily living? My advice would be always follow your medical professional's advice. Um, I'm not a medical professional. I'm just one person with one disability. But for me, the sort of mobility aids that really aid my life are things like my adapted car that allow me to drive, my electric wheelchair that I'm sitting in today. Now, I can't stand, transfer or walk. So without my wheelchair, my life would be completely different. Um, other mobility aids that are less obvious are probably my hoist that are in my bedroom and my bathroom that allow me to get in and out of bed and use the bathroom just as you guys would. Yes. Well, and, and on that note as well, I was listening to your episode with uh, Jordan Steele John in Western Australia, which entirely mesmerized me to, to realize that there are politicians with disabilities who are obviously activists for disability as well. Um, and I was listening to some of it, and you guys, you, you mentioned that you know Parliament wasn't entirely accessible for a disabled person given well I was saying to Brendan earlier you know we me and him see a flight of stairs and it's no biggie we'll we'll go up there but you know I was I was listening to your episode as well how you never leave the house without lipstick and you had to be in an elevator as much as you did not like to be in one you were in your elevator so my question then to you is that do you think the world would be a better place if everyone were disabled? Oh, I've never really thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see disability as a negative, but I think having a disability is something to be really proud of. Mm -hmm. And it's something that diversifies, diversifies society. And I think if we were all the same, regardless of whether it's race or religion or mm -hmm. gender, it would be a pretty boring world, in my opinion. So I just see disability, you know, as another great flavour in the world that we can all interact with and enjoy. Yes, of course, you, you'd have to have, if you don't have, you know, various cultural foods in a food court, you wouldn't have as many customers that come to the food court, I imagine. So, yeah, I just imagine in, in that way, more people would see things from your point of view. You'd have a voice because everyone else had, in one sense or another, something similar to you then. Uh, I, see, I see your point. I think probably the most effective way to overcome the sort of barriers that people with disabilities face is mm -hmm. better representation. So, mm -hmm. like, I don't know what it's like in South Africa, Brendan, but here in Australia, you don't see really anybody on television with a disability. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, there's no news anchors there's sort of no, no one in the media industry in particular with a with an obvious disability mm. movies television radio all those mediums to have better representation would allow everyone to realize that people with disabilities exist and that we're valuable members of society well then in that note as well and you guys were talking about the allies for disabilities with Jordan Steele John. Do you then feel that you do have allies for your disability? 
Absolutely. Everybody can be an ally to the disabled community, just as I'm an ally to the LGBTQI community, Mm -hmm. Um, just because I don't necessarily identify with that community myself doesn't mean I don't love and support people who identify in that community. And the disability community is really starting to gain momentum and support with people that don't identify as disabled. Yeah, beautiful. And one of my favourite actors of all time is Daniel Day-Lewis. And one of his standout films uh, was My Left Foot, which he portrayed the, the character of um, Christy Brown, which is a very influential writer with cerebral palsy. And I read up that Daniel Day-Lewis in this film was so dedicated to it that he actually hunched over for so long and would not break character that he broke one of his ribs. Wow. Do you... Do you appreciate this meticulous research and dedication he did to this role? Do you think a film like this perhaps does justice to the 17 million people worldwide that has it? Or do you think it maybe gives it a bad rap? And what is your take on this? I feel conflicted. I I really, I haven't seen the film, I should say that firstly. But having people who aren't disabled representing people with disabilities on film, I feel really conflicted. Because on the one hand, it's illustrating our experience and showing mainstream, the mainstream public what it is to have a disability. On the other, I'm sure there are so many great actors with disabilities that would have brought Mm. more knowledge to that role. You know, I, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be an actor with a disability because you are constantly typecast to having a disability mm. and that is your whole character so when there is a main character just as Daniel Day-Lewis took on I think it would be great to have somebody in the community getting that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely I think that's where it comes in as we said earlier to get a bit more representation not only in news and media but also in film and stuff um, to be just a bit more aware and I think that will be a wonderful thing that we you could strive towards uh, as a community. Absolutely. I think there's a big misconception even today that people with disabilities only want to work in the disability sphere. And currently that's because that's where we get our opportunities. Um, but there are a lot of people that just want to do normal jobs. You know, they might want to be a florist. They might want to be a chef. They might want to be a doctor. To have full equality, I think people with disabilities deserve to have the career that they want, regardless of their disability. Absolutely. I think also one of the famous actors, um, I don't know if you can give me his name, in Breaking Bad, he's actually one of the famous actors that also has cerebral palsy, which played... Um... There's Walter White's son. I for, uh, I forgot there you are, yes. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yes, he's, he's brunette. Sorry. Uh, I've forgotten his name. Maybe you could do a quick yes. Google. Of course. <laughs> but yeah, so you're trying to say like it turns out that his name was, uh, it's actually Walter White Jr. So he's, he's his son, Walter yeah. Jr. His name is IJ Mite or Mitt, M-I-T-T-E. So you're saying that he, or well, I imagine what your point would have been is that he played this character who has cerebral palsy because he himself in actual fact has mm. cerebral palsy. And that yes, was- but I think actually, yeah. I was just going to say, he was the first person I'd ever watched on television with cerebral palsy. Mm. Mm. And I think actually we're going forward in a good manner as that we are evolving in TV and film. As you look like a film like My Left Foot came out, what, in the 80s or 90s? This is a more modern show. It it just comes to show it's only a drop in the bucket is what we'd say here. But definitely, I think it's already better than it was 20 or so years ago. A bit more representation, I think. If that is something to look forward as a sh- uh, Emmy Award winning show like Breaking Bad, having such good representation, it can only go up from here. And I really enjoyed in particular the fact that he had a disability really wasn't a plot point. It was just, mm. you know, something that was a part of him. Yes. Yeah, it was just it was just there and no one really noticed every, anything else about it except for the fact that, yeah, his son just has special needs and... Um, uh, well, I was also going to ask then, you said you have a couple of degrees you've studied. Has, 
has your disability ever interfered with your study life? Like, you know, you, you obviously have to be at the doctor's office a lot. Some days you can't be on campus. And I imagine this was long before we had the online Zoom lectures happening. So was there any way that, or even the campuses, were they um, ever suitable for people with disabilities to have ramps and elevators? How did that affect your education? Before I go into education, I think as a disability advocate, it would be remiss of me to say that special needs is not a term that we say anymore. Okay. Um, you know, it's personally, it's sort of, it's because it others, us. So it's better to say a person with a disability or a disabled person. Okay, that's fine. That is, so we'll, we'll cut the euphemism out then, let's say. So then, yeah, like, has it, has it at all affected your ability to, have an education? Uh, it was, again, I'm very privileged in the fact that I came as far as my background and my parents from an environment that really valued my education and really pushed me forward to make sure that I used my potential intellectually. I loved university. It really enabled me to feel confident in my identity because the universities were so willing to make sure that I was included, felt included, and things were adapted for me. So, for example, I can't transfer onto a toilet, whether it's a disabled toilet or not. I need a hoist. So the university put in a hoist, which meant I could attend university. And that one barrier defined my ability of whether I could be on campus or not. So if you had not had any support from the university whatsoever, or if it was just a case of, well, you have to make do with what we have, do you think that would be the make or break point for your degree? I don't know about you guys, but I can't hang on for more than four hours. So, you know, it would be probably touch and go if I had two lectures in one day. Yeah, and it is, you know, it is it is quite frustrating because Brendan and myself, we actually are both university students and I can't speak for, you know, the University of the Free State, which is where he is, but um, where I go, which is La Trobe University, I do know that they are quite inclusive and I'm not sure how the pandemic has affected any of this, but there were actually groups that were inclusive of people who had disabilities. Um, the seminars were recorded as well, if so if you could not attend for whatever reason, you could always just log on with the PowerPoint and you could take your notes. Um, exams, I, again, I wasn't on campus long enough to actually sit an exam in the, on campus, but I imagine there would have been some sort of catering. Um, even, even Brendan was telling me about something the other day about how they cater for, for certain individuals who are blind or deaf or vision impaired, something in that instance. Uh, perhaps. Yes, um, we have a department at the University of the Free State. So if you have a disability, you just um, contact them and they can give you some assistance. They can even assign someone to assist you. Because I remember when we used to go to classes, you, I, I study law, by the way, and some of the law students there, if they were blind um, students, there were also some deaf students, and they would have a specific person there doing sign language um, while the lecturer was there and the other blind person as well. They have some assistance there. And even when we stayed online during the pandemic, there was also separate recordings of classes just in sign language and things. So they do cater for that. And I think that is awesome, you know, going forward in the education system, because we never saw that in my time in high school or primary school. There were always special needs schools and that, which I think is quite wrong because we are all exactly the same. We're all human beings. And it's awesome for me to see as we can all study together and make friends and that's just such a big thing for me just including everyone absolutely i think separating people with disabilities away from the main education cohort is only going to be detrimental to both parties to be honest because people with disabilities can offer different perspectives and learning opportunities that you both probably wouldn't experience otherwise and, you know, I can only speak from my university for both my degrees. I went to Monash University and they were fantastic. Just as you said, Brendan, they had the online lectures. It was very, very flexible and they were willing to listen to any, any 
uh, idea that I had that enabled me to be able to engage with education more effectively. So it is, it was a, a real reflection and a real turning point for me in how there's a difference between primary and high school education and then further education. I think the further education institutions really do value and understand everybody. And then, so on that bombshell then, what is the outlook for the I Can't Stand podcast going into 2022? Are you going to include some other guests going forward who, you know, for instance, in, at Monash University, how you have these catered services for disabled students, are you going to move over in that direction? Or what, what's the outlook from here on, Peter? So my first podcast for this year was talking about goal setting and I'm really passionate to bring my listeners with me in the process. So my big goal for 2022 is to make International Day for People with Disabilities more mainstream. Try and get it more offline because I don't know about you guys, but it was very online last year and I know that might be partly due to the pandemic, but I think it would be really great for the day to gain more significance overall. So that's the big goal for this year. And I've already, I think, recorded six interviews that are coming up in the feed very soon. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's amazing. And so as our final question, it's just been an amazing interview altogether. I, I have learned a few things I genuinely did not know about disability and I hope that anyone who can listen to this will take something from it as well because at Finding Borders we would like to have meaningful conversations with our hosts and we found that the medical field whether it was with our previous host Dr. Marta Cohen um, it does draw attention because not much is known about a lot of things like this child of wolf person syndrome just so my final question to you then is what is something you would like to say to someone who has a disability, whether it's something that's recently happened or they were born with it like yourself? What is one piece of advice you wish you had heard that you were going to express to them? I think the one thing for me, I wish I had have had someone like me to listen to, to go, oh my goodness, she survives through her teenage years. Oh my goodness, she survives through her 20s. Oh my goodness, she did get that degree despite what people expected her to do. So I think for me, it's all about sitting in your own self, knowing what your goals are and what you want to do in life and trying to really align yourself with positive people that believe in you just as much as you believe in yourself. Beautiful answer. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Peter Hook. And honestly, I wish all the best from here in Australia and over there in South Africa, the best for your I Can't Stand podcast. May you reach all the audiences you wish to. And it has been amazing and wonderful. Thank, Thank you, guys. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. It was absolutely awesome meeting you.